information. Um, we have the, the next Sunday is the Sunday of the prodigal son, right? And how did he return? How did he return? What did, what did it start with? He came to himself. He came to himself. That's the self-review. That's the self-examination. That is, what is it that I want? Why do I want it? And how do I get it? It's not a desire, it's a want. And want has action. <coughs> There's a reason why our Lord Jesus Christ asked the question, because sometimes we may not be able to handle the answer. What does it mean when I go to him and I say I want to be healed? It means there has to be a commitment. There has to be a change in my life, right? He said to him at the end, what is the last verse that we read? Or the second to last verse? Go and sin no more. So now there's a, re there's a responsibility. I have to do something that I wasn't doing before. Someone once said, if you want to get somewhere you've never been, you have to do something you've never done. If you want to get somewhere you've never been, you have to do something that you've never done. So I always add to it just a little bit because I like to uh, make it simpler for myself. And I say, if we continue to do the things that we're doing today, we will continue to remain exactly where we are. Sorry. Um, if we continue to do exactly what we're doing today, where do you think we're going to end up? Exactly in the same place. If I want something different, if I want something more, I have to do something different. So accepting the healing means accepting a commitment, accepting a change. Be willing to make the change. Be willing to carry out and sustain the change. Be willing to be committed. Committed to who? Committed to God. Committed to keep this change that I'm, when I turn back to him in Jeremiah, 31 verse 18. Excellent, excellent, excellent verse. Jeremiah 31, 18. Restore me and I will return for you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning, I have repented. Restore me for you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning, I have repented. When does my repentance start? After turning to the Lord. That's the only way that I can begin my repentance. I can't do it on my own. I can't do it on my own. I must first turn to him and then he gives me the strength to be able to repent. But I have to be serious about it. I have to really want it. So what do you think this person is feeling? He's feeling helpless. He's feeling frustrated. He's feeling despair. He's feeling abandoned. He's feeling alone. Does that sound familiar to any of us? We ever go through those kind of feelings even though we don't have this infirmity that, that we've had, that this person has had for all this time? <clears throat> How does it feel to be so close to the water? And imagine, how does it feel that he's so close to the water, so close to healing, and yet he can't get it? So close to healing, and can't get it. What am I so close to and I can't get? Am I so close to God, and all I have to do is just say the word, I want to be healed? Am I that close to him and all I know, do I believe that? That I'm close to him, number one, and he's close to me? And that I want to get healed, all I have to do is just say the word? Peter, when he started to sink, all he had to do was say, help me. Right? Our Lord Jesus Christ could have left him and said, well, you know what? You have a little faith. <laughs> you know? Had you just had a little bit more faith, everything would have been great. But, so there has to be some work that we're ready to do on our part. So what happens when I'm on my bed of sin and I'm reaching for help and I'm seeking after my sin? He gives me hope today and he says, you know what, I'm still knocking at your door and I'm still asking you, do you want to be made well? I won't leave you. I'll still continue to knock. But I'm waiting for you to respond. And I'm waiting for you to respond not just by well, you know, I've been trying and I've been looking for my father of confession. I've been trying to go to church. All these things keep coming up. Uh, my studies take a lot of my time. Uh, you know, I'm involved in three sports. I'm, uh, I'm trying to help a buddy of mine and uh, they're really in trouble. And all of my time is consumed. And every time I schedule time with my father of confession, you know, he, he calls and cancels or I call and have something else to do. Is there commitment? 
do I take it serious? Do I really want to be healed? Um, so I know someone who, this is very recent, it's a true story. Uh, I know someone who I was talking to about two days ago, and uh, they're, they're very sick with a really, really bad cold. It's a really bad cold. To the extent that when they, when they sit up, they, their throat is so inflamed that they have trouble breathing, so they have to lie down, right? And um, I talked to them on Tuesday. And I said, uh, how long has it been? And they said, well, it's been like a week now. I said, are you taking anything? He said, yeah, I'm taking medication. <coughs> so I asked them what they're taking, and not that I'm a doctor, but I said, okay, you know, I know a couple of things about uh, when I feel sick, this is why I like to take and what works for me. So I gave them some advice, and I said, hey, listen, why don't you go to your doctor? Here's a thought, right? Why don't you go see a professional? And um, he said, well, I don't know what doctor to go to and all this stuff, and I know this family. So I said, uh, uh, your wife has a doctor. I know who the doctor is. Your wife has a doctor. The doctor's in the office Wednesday mornings. So why don't you go to the doctor on Wednesday morning and see if they'll prescribe something? Maybe you're getting a virus. Maybe you're getting some type of bacteria. Maybe you need something stronger than over-the-counter stuff. And um, he said, well, I don't know where the doctor is. I'm like, you bring your wife there all the time, right? <laughs> Sound familiar? Sounds like this man and his response, right? So I said, just go and don't worry. And that was the end of the conversation. And then yesterday, I talked to them and I said, uh, did you go? And guess what they said? Yeah. No, they didn't go. And I said, why did you go? So I don't know what doctor to go to. <laughs> this is the exact conversation, I'm not lying. <laughs> and. Uh, I said, the same doctor that your wife goes to. So I don't know where that is. I said, and I gave him the location because I happen to know the doctor. And I said, this per your, your wife's doctor is in this place. All you had to do was go because the doctor's in the office this morning. And then I hear him calling to his wife, where's your doctor again? Which doctor is he talking about? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, do you really want to be made well? Right? <laughs> I'll take out we're on the phone. <laughs> because at times you're sitting there thinking, oh my God, I just want to knock some sense into you. Right? And this is a true story, I'm telling you. It's a, it, it really... So I said, do me a favor. Don't even call because I know the doctor takes walk-ins. Go tomorrow morning, about today. Do you think they're going to go today? No. I don't think so. And then his response to me after that one, well, which doctor should I see? And then he came up with a whole bunch of excuses. Oh, you know, I think somebody needs my car. I got to drive somebody somewhere. Maybe it's All of his illness. illness. It was maybe, maybe it was his crazy. illness. Maybe. So that's exactly what we do, right? That's exactly what we do. We justify our weight. We justify our prolonging. We justify our holding off. And the devil is very good at that. Abu Nasriyad al used to call him Shushu. Right? Shushu is very, very good at that. Right? He's excellent at postponing. Somebody told me this little joke, um, and I, I can't promise to know all of it, but I'll tell you the pieces that I do remember. Uh, some of you may know it, and then you'll correct it. So there was uh, Satan who was trying to graduate some new little creatures, right, to, to help out in, the, in, in his mission. And um, he would ask each one of them to determine if they're ready to, uh, to graduate. What are you going to do to make man fall? And the first one said, oh, I'm going to make them think that there is no God. Anybody know it? Anybody have heard it before? Yeah. 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 It's three right. devils. So, I don't remember what the second one did, but I, I remember the first one. Was heard. So the, the first one kind of said something like, I'm going to make them believe that God doesn't exist. He said, you know, that's great, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's been done before. So you still need a little more cooking. So you stay inside. And then the second one, I don't remember what the second one, anybody remember what the second one told them? I don't remember what the second one did. But the third one said um, something very interesting. He said, I will tell them to go to church. I will tell them to go take communion. I will tell them to go and stand up for prayer. I will tell them to read the Bible. I will tell them to go see their father's confession. So do it tomorrow. <laughs> Is that what we're doing? Or do we really want to be made well? So here it sounds like it's a rhetorical question, but it really is not. Do I really have the need to be healed? Do I really want this thing to move away from me? By definition, sin is what? Separation from God. Do I want to be reunited again? 
Or can I have all these excuses, and maybe they're justified excuses, take my time off and prevent me from uh, getting cleansed. <clears throat> so each one of us has a question to answer. Do I, really be want, do I really want to be made well? Do I really want to be healed? Do I have, am I taking it serious enough? You all have, I, I mean, I see all of you are writing, which is great, but um, I'm afraid that maybe the paper will get lost in the shuffles. The, the very thing that I like to use all the time, because you all carry it and you can't sleep and go anywhere where you can't leave your house without it. This is cruel. Um, it's, it's my, it's my <laughs> But our cell phones. So I say, make your notes in your cell phone, right? Especially in, in this question. Do I, really be, do I really want to be made well? And if I do, what are the things that I want to be made well from? Ask yourself. Now remember that the question begs a self-examination. The question begs, I need to sit with myself and really determine, deep down, what are the things that are preventing me from being well? What are the things that are preventing me from being healed? Is it me? Am I getting in my own way? Or is it someone else? Or is it something else? Is it a habit? Is it a relationship? Is it a person? Is it a certain belief or is it a certain creed? We all know the Orthodox creed by heart, right? We believe in one God, God the Father, God the Father. We all know that. But internally, we have our own creed. I believe in this, even though the church says that. I, I, I don't see any reason why I can't do it. I don't see any reason why I should stop. Is there anything that I need to change my mindset on? It's almost like, remember that I was telling you the difference between desire and want. It's almost like I always tell people, <clears throat> St. James says, faith without works is dead. Right? You all have taken science. You all know what phenotype and genotype are. Right? Phenotype <laughs> is the outward expression. So these, these little genes, so let's say I have black hair, although we're white now, but let's say I have black hair, um, and the, it's dominant. So the, the, the gene for black hair may be a capital B and a small b, or a capital B and a capital B. Right? That's the, the, the letters are the genotype. The phenotype is how it actually expresses itself. It's black hair. The phenotype is something that you can see. The genotype is something that's uh, just chromosome. Okay? Faith without works is dead. Right? The works are the outward expression of faith. Works are the outward expression of faith. So if faith is, is the genotype, works are the phenotype. You with me? Not a little bit. Not now. You ever see those signs where, uh, you know, when you're sitting in an audience, it says clap now? So. Okay, so this is the exact same concept. This is the exact same concept. If I really want it, if I really want it, I have to act like I want it. I have to do the things that show that I want it. So I ask myself, what is my response? And if I asked you, I won't say, but if I asked you, would your response be, well, um, yeah, I kind of think I really, maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I'm not really sure. I thought I did, but now after I hear about all this, maybe I don't really know. So what's the first step? The first step is a self-examination. This question should promote that in you. This question should make you think about, why do I want to be healed? Why do I want to be healed? Do I believe that he has done this, this, this mission of salvation for me? Do I take it personal? Or do I think that uh, when we, when we, when we, my, we have a couple of early nights here, my favorite verse is John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he was that, who, that whoever, whosoever believes in him. Yeah, I mean, that invitation is open to each one of us. Just like the invitation here is open to each one of us. Do you want to be made well? So I thank God that I have the ability to repent. I have the strength and I have the, the, the knowledge and the know-how. The problem is I get all these things that, that get stuck in my way. You see, it's a matter of perception. It's, it's basically based on what my perception is. Someone asked His Holiness, Pope Shenouda, and they said, I keep, every time 
I try to get up from the sin, and I fall. Every time I try to get up from the sin, I fall. Every time I try to get up from the sin, I fall. What do I do? And His Holiness said, you know what? Let's just change your perception just a little bit. Rather than say, every time I try to get up from the sin, I fall, we're going to say, every time I fall in the sin, I get up. Every time I fall in the sin, I get up. Every time I fall in the sin, God gives me the ability to rise again. One is full of hope. One is full of despair. It's all in my mind. It's a perception. The devil tries to continue to put in your mind that no one is going to help you. Just sit. And then we become paralyzed. This is why I told you in the beginning it's important that we recognize that this person had the infirmity for 38 years, but he wasn't by the pool for 38 years. Right? You think it came on overnight? Do you think it was full-blown, I'm paralyzed completely overnight? This was gradual, right? Just like sin in my life is gradual. And if I let it go and let it go and let it go and I don't pay attention to it and I don't try to clean it, guess what happens? It paralyzes me. So if this person had taken it a little bit serious, a little bit earlier, what would have happened? Would he have to wait and rely on someone else? No. And then who do I rely on when I want to rely on someone? Am I relying on myself? Am I relying on others? Um, who do I rely on when I do go for help or hope? Who do I rely on? God. Um, I'm going to read you a couple of um, a couple of sayings by a person. He is a uh, he's a great motivational speaker. His name is Jim Ron. Anybody ever heard of him? No. Great motivational speaker. Um, and I'm going to just read you a couple of the, the sayings that he has. When you know what you want, and you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to get it. When you know what you want, and you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to get it. Uh, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. Don't wish for less challenges, wish for more wisdom. What does that all lead to? It's all in how I perceive things. He said, I used to say, I sure hope things will change. Remember, I kept telling you, remember that word change. I used to say, I sure hope things will change. Then I learned that the only way things are going to change for me is when I change. Remember, I was telling you, if you want to get somewhere you've never been, you have to do something that you've never done. And one of the real nice things he says, you cannot speak that which you do not know, you cannot share that which you do not feel, you cannot translate that which you do not have, and you cannot give that which you do not possess. To give it and to share it and for it to be effective, you first must have it. So if I'm intending on helping others, or if I'm so involved in helping others, and I can't help myself, I can't really share something I don't have. If I'm trying to give others Christ, or if I'm trying to give God to others, and I don't have Him, I can't share Him with anybody else. I can't share something with someone that I don't personally possess. So, we see something that explains why He said we want to be made well, and He says, take up your bed and walk. Right? So He gave him an action to do, and He gave him an action that relied on who? On whose abilities? His own. So now he wanted to break him away from the thinking of, Khalas, now I'm, I'm depending on somebody and I'm going to sit here and wait. I'm going to sit here and wallow. I'm going to sit here and become the victim. I'm going to sit here and continue to mourn <coughs> until I can find somebody who will give me the kick or give me the push or shove me when the, when the water gets stirred. He said, no, your dependence now is on your own abilities. Don't use anyone else as a crutch or don't use anything else as a crutch. Are we get ready to give up our dependencies on people, on things, on habits? Even thought processes that we have? What is the hope? The hope is this man had, even though we may look at him and think we, we didn't have any hope, he had a little bit of hope. Because he wouldn't be sitting by the, by the pool if there wasn't just a little bit of hope. He would have given up completely. But the fact that he's there shows us that he has a little bit of hope. And our Lord Jesus Christ, one of the reasons that he asked the question, is to make public the hope of this person. To make public the hope of this person. So, 
He says that you have this hope, but do you really want it? Do you really want it? The other thing is, he wanted to draw attention away from the water toward the need to have a man help us. And that man is who? Christ. Christ himself fulfilled that. So he wanted to remove the thought from his mind that I'm relying on other people and to shift the focus from the water and the people to Christ himself. I, I can't do anything on my own. The verse says, well, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. So here's another story. Um, there was a psychologist who discovered a prison where all these murderers were. And uh, once in a while or once a day, they would give them the ability to go out and walk around. On their, when they're murderers, they keep them locked up constantly for the obvious reason. But um, they, uh, they would give them the opportunity to go out Excuse me, and be free in an area obviously that's limited once a day. But to get it, they used to take a deck of cards, and the person who found the ace would be the one who would be able to gain this little freedom or this healing just for a few minutes that he would get. Right? And uh, what would happen is the big boys would beat up the little boys, right, to get the card. And the only time that someone was able to go outside is the ones with the big muscles, the ones who had the ability to get the card and push people around and shove and beat up. But then somebody came and said, well, that's not fair. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to change it so that we're going to pull people's names out of a hat so that everyone has an opportunity. Everyone has the opportunity to go out and, gain, and get and gain this freedom. That's what we see in Christ. So before, maybe it was the people who knew the law. Maybe it was the people who knew how to follow Christ. Maybe it was the chosen people. But in his coming and in his teachings, he showed us that now everyone has the opportunity to be healed. Every one of us. It's no longer the strongest. It's no longer the smartest. It's no longer the richest. It's no longer the person who shows. It's not. It's everyone. That's why it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever... Anyone, whosoever, that believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But it's not enough to just say, I want it. I have to show in my actions that I want it. So, in asking the question, our summary says here, in asking the question, it stimulates the man's faith. He stimulates the man's faith. And what does faith do in our life? We see in the, uh, the woman who was hemorrhaging that had the blood flow. This is in Mark uh, chapter 5, verse 25 through 34. We see that all she had to do was what? Touch him. And then he says, who touched me? Power left for me. And his disciples are thinking, are you out of your mind? Do you know how many people that are here? Everybody's touching you. He said, no, someone touched me who had faith. Power left for me, healing left for me. So what does faith do? It takes power from God. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives within me. So it's to stimulate the man's faith. It's to get the motives of the man out so that he actually does a self-examination so that he may see why do I really want it? Do I really want it? And why do I really want it? It deals with an issue of complacency or neglect from a previous stage. Right? That's why he said, I'm asking you the question, and at the end he said, go and sin no more, lest something worse come up on you. So, are you happy with complacency? Are you happy with the situation and circumstance that you're in today? Are you happy playing the victim? Are you happy playing... I'm going to blame everybody and everything around me. Are we comfortable in that? Is that what we know? Is that what we've grown to know over these 30-something years? Um, so that he could be an example of faith to those around him. And to see if he really wants to give up 
the sin, to see if he really wants to give up the sin. The, um, the Gospel of St. Matthew, uh, chapter 9, talks about the two blind, the two blind men. He asks yeah, a similar question, but it doesn't test just their abilities. It tests their faith. He says, when they wanted to be healed from their blindness, he asked them, do you really think that I can do this? Sounds like today's question, right? Do you really think that I can do this? And they said, yes, we know you can. And he said, let it be according to your faith and belief. Okay? So, it's important that each one of us today answers that question. So, in your phones, write in, do I want to be healed? And then, the things that I want to be healed from. What are the things that I can think of today that are holding me back? Not holding me back from just being successful as a person, but spiritually. What are the things that are holding me back? Write those things down, and then put a plan together that creates the want in the determination of action. We need to have action. Faith without works is dead. Right? So if I don't want to search, if I don't want to seek, if I don't want to work, then I'm going to answer that question by saying, well, you know, I really want to be healed, but uh, I really don't have anybody, and I come up with all of these different excuses like this person. Any comments or questions before we go to your homework piece? <laughs> Comments, questions? It's okay. So those who participated in the game, raise your hands. Okay. So at least between the four or eight people, we changed three things each. So that's at least uh, 32 things with one person who changed two, right? Any of the things that you changed, <coughs> did you keep them that way? Yes. <laughs> How many of us changed most of them back? Would you, would you say you changed everything? How we left one thing? I changed everything. So you see that it's not really it's not really a memory game. It's not really a memory game, although we call it that. It's not really a memory game. What it tests is your ability to become acceptable to change. Right? The person who, uh, Tony, you put your hair down, right? Yeah. And you put your eyebrows this way. <laughs> it's uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And somebody changed their shoes and put their right foot in their left foot and their left foot in their right foot. They couldn't stand it long enough. As soon as the person got it, they switched the shoes back, right? Am I willing to cope with change? How do I deal with change? Because if I want to be made well, there has to be a change. How do I accept that change? <laughs> do I seek it? Do I search for it? Or I say it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be something I'm not familiar with, it's going to be something that I don't like, it's going to feel weird. Yeah, it's going to be all of those things. But do you understand the flip side of that, what you get and what the benefits are? Does that make sense to you? So maybe I don't like my hair up that way and I can't stand my eyebrows that way, and maybe my shoes don't fit right if I put my right foot in the left foot. So those things are simple. But what about a change in my life? What about if I break away from a certain habit, or a certain belief, or a certain place, or certain thoughts? What will that do for me? That will set me free. But only through who? Only through Christ. I can't do anything on my own. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. So take it serious, and really ask yourself, when we read the Bible, I always tell people, the more you read the Bible, the more you understand how God works in your life. Because a lot of people say, well, I don't know how God works. I don't see. I don't see. I don't see. So, well, do you read the Bible? Well, no. Well, how do you expect to know how He works if you don't read the way He's worked? Hebrews 13.8 says what? Anybody know? Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same way He's worked in the past is the same way He's working today is the same way He'll continue to work in the future. There's no rocket science. Our faith is very simple. He asks us to do certain things, and if we do those certain things, He promises that we will be reconciled to Him and we'll have eternal life. So think about that change in your mind. What are the things that I have to break away from? 
What are the things that I want to break away from? Because you may find those two lists are different. Things that I have to break away from and things that I want to break away from. You'll see the difference between the motivation. And then put steps together. Work with your father of confession. And if you don't have one, find one. Work with your father of confession to set a plan that helps you take out 